Hello everyone, and welcome to Andrew Broussard Watercolors. Today I'm trying something a little bit different. My camera is way zoomed out and it's really high up on the tripod. So my whole desk is being shown. However, I'm going to try and crop it so that we can just get in on the image itself. And you know, with this experiment, we're gonna see how well the detail in that video shows up. I think that the detail will be there. Okay, so today I have a quarter sheet of Stonehenge Aqua in front of me, um, 11 by 14, 11 by 15, but it would be matted to that. I have it in portrait orientation. It is 100% cotton and it is 140 pound cold press. So with today's experiment, it's been something that's been on my mind and it's been kind of um, mountainous landscapes. While I saturate this paper and kind of let it soak and stretch, I'll kind of talk about what's been going on in my mind and what I've been thinking about. So um, if you look on the channel, you've probably seen a mixture of the oil painting, the Chinese brush painting, watercolor, pen and ink, and other mediums. Um, the main two things that's being influenced or influencing this one is the Chinese brush painting and the watercolor. Where in oriental style, it seems that uh, sometimes um, perspective is kind of lost or greatly exaggerated, where you have these huge mountainous landscapes that um, I think for the most part are usually imaginary, but um, they extend very high up. And in fact, the ratio, the kind of uh, proportions for the paper itself is usually a scroll and extended. So I've been thinking about that and carrying it over into Western watercolors and making it more, I don't wanna use the word realistic because it's not gonna be um, a realistic painting. You know, it's gonna be an imaginary scene, but um, something that would kind of make more sense from the Western watercolor standpoint. So that's kind of um, the idea that's taking place here. I'm gonna play around. It'll be an imaginary scene. I'm gonna have to start looking for photos online of mountainous scenes. Um, one of the issues is that if I go onto a free site where people are sharing photos for artists to use, I don't know if I can then share them in these videos. So even though it's free to use for artists, I'm not sure. I would have to find something and then contact the, um, the photographer, and I don't want to um, step on any toes. Anywho, I'm going to start out wet and wet, and let's grab some ultramarine blue, and last night I was playing with some different ideas, and I'll, I'll talk about them as I get to the different elements. I'm not the biggest fan of uh, portrait orientation. You probably don't see me use it that often. Um, with tearing the paper in this fashion and clipping it, this would wind up showing um, underneath a 11 by 14 mat. So it's kind of just a little too cramped, I feel, horizontally in this case. But it's necessary for me to kind of achieve what I'm rambling about. Okay, so ultramarine blue. Let's grab some um, raw sienna into this. Right down a little bit. And even though I'm painting these guys right now, the sky and the water, I'm thinking what I want to do um, in regards to the mountains. So a few different ideas are crossing my mind. This is raw sienna right here, just kind of for the far shore line. And I'll do raw sienna and burnt sienna for a closer short line. So 
Far Distant Mountain. Um, I want to have something that's kind of coming off the side here. So compositionally, I'm going to focus on that. As well as atmospheric perspective where it's going to recede in the picture plane. So I'm going to use most likely light red oxide and ultramarine for it. So it's a, a kind of that light purple that I use for distant objects. But if I was to do that now in my wet and wet stage, I would start having a lot of um, a lot of issues. I would have the bleeding into it. I wouldn't get that crisp edge. And I feel like the crisp edge is kind of important for uh, far distant mountains. So I'm thinking there's two options. And I'm mixing some um, Payne's Gray and Alizarin Crimson while I kind of ramble. The two options that are coming to mind, and these are going to be clouds, is that I can wait for it to dry and then kind of brush that mountain in. But I'll be brushing it over that background wash that I'm doing. And that might cause some issues. So what I'm thinking is paper towel and lifting that guy out so I get the white of the paper and I'll have the general form of this background mountain. My friend Eva, she lives in, in town, um, but she grew up in Michigan, I think. And I don't know the mountain range up there, but I remember her going up to visit and posting a picture where across the water you could see that huge um, mountain. And it was very uh, kind of white and blue. And I wonder if just kind of lifting in this fashion could be used to represent a mountain. It might be something to further explore, but I don't think I want to leave the white of the paper for that. Now my next thing, and I, I probably brought it out a little bit more than I wanted to, but this is just a lot of exploration and a lot of um, <laughs> rambling. Let's get some ultramarine and burnt sienna. And I'm going to put in kind of that shadow reflection on the water of that mountain. I figured this would be a good way to kind of frame in that side. And this side here will most likely have some sort of tree element, something coming up to stop the eye from going off the other side. So, uh, also, just kind of a disclaimer, um, we gave Percy a new collar yesterday, and the collar has a bell on it, so if you hear the jingling in the background, which that was right there, that's, that's Percy playing with the collar. Um, if it's distracting, let me know in the comments. <laughs> um... It was a collar with, uh, it is a collar with a um, little sushi on it, around her neck. Now, uh, one thing that I had thought about last night, and I'm kind of just throwing a lot of things at y'all, and I apologize if it's all over the place, but one thing that I thought about, if you're going to have an imposing large mountain you're going to have that foreground hills leading up to it, most likely. The closer one is going to be more um, more detailed. It's going to have the trees on it. So I'm going to kind of put in this guy. It may have been better to dry brush him in because we are going over the area wiped out and then there is wet right below it but it might give an interesting effect we'll see what happens get 
a little bit more variety rather than just going horizontally with it. And then in this guy, in the wet and wet stage, I can grab a larger concentration and this is burnt sienna and ultramarine. Um, I'm using that combination just because it's kind of an easy go-to that everybody would have on their palette. It minimizes the amount of colors that I'm utilizing. And um, yesterday I was just getting some beautiful granulation with uh, ultramarine blue. So these are kind of the shadows, the tree lines, the ridges, etc. It's wet and wet, so it's going to be soft. And we can come over that either closer in the picture for, uh, plane, like maybe in this region right here, with more um, detailed images of um, trees and whatnot. We'll see. While we're wet and wet, let's add some elements here. Stretch this out some. So that's one of the things I miss about, I, I grew up on Long Island. We didn't really have mountains, but um, it was in the Boy Scouts and stuff like that. And we would travel and hike into the mountains. And that's something I always uh, miss is the, uh, the North Shore of Long Island and um, the Hudson River Valley area and all those type of things where, um, you know, there are those large mountains and um, paths and trees. Down here in Louisiana, especially southern Louisiana, there's really no elevation changes. And um, as you may know, I use a little bit of paint gray. I longboard and skateboard around town. And if I could get a slight gradient to go down, it's a blessing. <laughs> All right. Or if you go about an hour north of me, then you start seeing kind of the mountainous areas and not mountainous, but more hilly in Louisiana. Okay. So we're wet and wet stage. We're seeing if there's anything else we want to do ele elementally wise. Um, I was thinking about some sort of tree structure here coming up in front. Uh, if I do that, I think I want to make that decision now so I can kind of do a little bit of wet and wet foliage. And then from there, progress. So I think I can do that. So this is going to be a large tree coming from um, this front corner. This is some pure raw sienna so it's going to soften up and then when I go back over it we'll get a, um, a contrasting uh, effect and I'll grab some just heavy paints gray just to ground it in place right there okay so I'm going to do a dry off. Let me pause the camera. Okay. We should be dry enough and there should be something addressed right here. Uh, one difference or one major component of the Oriental art is the philosophical view of, you know, the painting itself and then the nothingness on the paper also being a part of the painting. And I think this tree right here would be quite the no-no or um, whatever phrase you want to use since we're kind of taking over that empty space there with a foreground element. But let me know below, what, would you have put that tree there or not? Now the next thing, I have the squirrel mop out, but I decided to, while I was drying off, use the hake still for this uh, background tree, uh, mountain. Reason being is that 
I want you guys to see the texture that would take place if I kind of just did a textural mountain. And then I might go in and smooth it all over. We'll see. Now how well that shows up on the camera, like I said, I pretty zoomed out, but I'm gonna crop it in. So by just simply jumping around, we have that texture there. We create the idea of the snow-capped mountains. Um, and it does add an element of interest. I was thinking about covering that whole spot up with that, um, that color, but I'm thinking that it might be best to, to leave those, some of those whites there. Let's push this a little bit further by taking a little stronger concentration of our mix and putting kind of three color varieties in there. It may be too ultramarine, but this is another thing. Let me know in the comments what y'all think. Okay, let's leave that background mountain like that. We'll then progress further to where we're going to be more um, textural, have more elements. So I'm going to use that same mixture, but warmed up with burnt sienna. And I'll do a little bit of dry brushing over it. And take that there you go for that water right there some strong raw sienna right there and I'm going to grab the number four rigor Gonna mix a stronger concentration of burnt sienna ultramarine and some Payne's gray. And this is in Chinese brush painting, I believe they call these uh, happy dots. And they're usually used to represent tree clusters. Um, moss, all those little elements. So I'll use them back here where it's just kind of a um, calligraphy type mark, just a dotting mark. And then when we move closer, we could probably put more tree ideas using the side of this rigger. Just so that we create Uh, another kind of uh, perspective within this painting where as we get closer our images our objects get larger and more um, defined whereas in oriental brush painting in some styles you might have the same size tree here as you would in the background further back or higher up on the mountain And yesterday I stumbled across like a pure application of raw sienna. It just had me um, just feeling really great. It was just um, between that and the ultramarine and the granulation that took place was really beautiful. Now, this might be going against kind of the nature of the painting by putting this here, but and against my my style of painting, where I usually paint dark and moody, figured I'd uh, throw that guy in there. And let me know what you think about that. If that kind of makes it pop more, or if it, um, excuse me, messes up 
his style. So okay, my dark mix again. This is where our tree will originate from. Um, I could use the number four rigger. I find that it handles enough water for me. And I haven't used the side of the hake in a while for trees, but I'm doing it. Use the number four for kind of a secondary tree. Ultramarine, burnt sienna. coming off the side. I'm going to grab a little bit of lemon yellow, try to get a little bit greener action. This is foliage creeping in. Now that dumping sound is Percy. She's on a desk behind me. Up on top. Well, she's turning the other way, not watching me, but She's like, she wags her tail. She's a cat that wags her tail. And um, she's knocking it against the desk. Just kind of using the card to scrape some elements. It might go greener in the foliage, some more lemon yellow. I think we would benefit from another dry off. So let me do a quick dry off and then we'll see what else needs to be done. Okay. Now I'm going to do what Joe Menza refers to for my paintings. Um, if you're, if you know Joe Menza, he's a great guy. Um, he does YouTube uh, painting videos as well. For me, <laughs> he's like uh, Bruce Ard's patented three layer technique. I, he said from my videos when he watches them, he noticed that I'll do uh, three layers. I guess the wet and wet, then that second effect, and then the third where I come in and get some contrast. Put in those, um, they wouldn't be highlights, I guess they'd be dark lights. I don't know, but it was, uh, it was funny when he pointed that out. By the way, um, me and him, along with Matthew Clemens, we moderate a Facebook page, Ron Rants and Disciples, which um, we'd love for you to enjoy, join. Got a lot of great painters on there. We got a lot of new painters on there. A lot of people looking to learn, and um, everybody's very helpful, very very friendly. You know, we all paint in the fast and loose style. And then you'd be amazed how different our paintings are, even though we are using a fast and loose style, and using a lot of the times the same palettes. Um, as I was drying off, I was thinking about how we got the snow-capped mountains back here, 
we have a tree in the foreground, we could go a lot greener with it, and that would be um, kind of talking about like if you wanted a scene to tell a picture, the picture would start saying, look at the green life and the growth that's down here while we have this big imposing mountain in the middle of the summer that still has snow on it, something like that. And it uh, creates that type of narrative. I don't usually put narratives into my paintings anymore, but um, things like that make it fun. This is Payne's Gray, building up those darks. I am going to wind up painting underneath where those clips are just in case I wind up matting it so it's not too white right there. Um, some other things to think about when I was drying off the happy dots, the dots in the mountains. Um, it's a good expression uh, feel to it, that dot. But it, um, it does kind of change the style some. Let's see if we can get kind of rounder, greener trees on the shore. I think that's one thing I had talked about doing. Got an interesting element here. So it's not too bad for imaginary scene. Um, I have been gravitating more, like I said, towards painting from photographs. However, um, I'm always worried about, you know, kind of the copyright ideas and uh, I want to be able to share what resources I use with you all watching this. By the way, you guys are always welcome to follow along with one of these paintings. You have my express permission to um, go ahead and write your name on it. And if you ever want to sell anything you have done from following one of my tutorials, you have my express permission and my blessing to do that. I um, want to see you all succeed and art supplies are expensive. So I think that, you know, selling a painting is very important. Um, but you don't have to sell any paintings. Um, I know, I know that I'm not the best painter and I tell a lot of people this around town. Like I, I know that, and I know that there's probably a thousand people that are better than me with it. The only difference is, is that I'm just putting my stuff out there and there's no right or wrong thing to do. If you don't want to put your art out there, that's totally fine. If you want to keep it within your house and, um, you know, and you enjoy it for that purpose, that's totally fine. But if you're ever um, keeping it because you're worried that it might not be good enough, trust me, it's good enough. And you know, sh share your work in that case. Like I said, join that Facebook page that I mentioned, Ron Ransom Disciples, and share it on there. And there's a lot of helpful art communities on Facebook besides that one that are more than willing to help um, new painters explore and learn and figure out um, how to change things around, etc. On that note, I also have the Patreon link down below if you want to support this channel. You know, please consider liking and subscribing. I do have exclusive content on the Patreon. And I also have some stuff for sale on Etsy, so if you ever want to own one of these paintings, 
have some stuff there or let me know. You can contact me directly. Just in case I didn't list it. Alright. So that would be my Joe Menza third layer. Let me um, do one last dry off. And there you have it. Let me sign my name and then I will shut down the video. Um, please, you know, like I said, like, subscribe, and comment. I try to answer every comment. If there's ever anything you want me to address or try to paint or a topic or something I'm not making clear, please let me know. Um, I feel like we should put little birds. There we go. All right. I hope you enjoyed. Have a great day.